Hello. Uh, today we're going to discuss another chapter in wireless sensor uh, networks. Uh, today's topic is uh, wireless sensor node uh, architecture. Uh, I have organized the talk as follows. Uh, first, I'll give you a brief uh, overview of the uh, different uh, subsystems of a wireless sensor nodes with a special emphasis on the uh, sensing subsystem and uh, processing subsystems. Then we will see the different types of uh, processor architectures and different types of uh, processors because the choice of processor is very important in terms of uh, the quality of uh, data we can uh, process locally and uh, uh, the amount of um, energy uh, we are willing to um, uh, invest in uh, uh, processing the data. Then we're going to see uh, different types of communication um, interconnect to uh, interconnect the different components of a wireless sensor node. And then I will um, uh, complete the uh, discussion by giving you the different types of uh, sensor node architectures to see the flexibility we have in choosing the different uh, components of a wireless sensor node. Uh, and in uh, interconnecting these uh, components. Uh, I begin uh, today's lecture by referring to Aristotle's uh, four uh, causes. Uh, Aristotle advertised that the existence of a given object can be explained by four different uh, causes. Or in other way, uh, he uh, asserts that four different causes are essential to bring about an object into uh, existence. Without these four causes, uh, the object cannot uh, be realized. So he says the first uh, cause is a material cause. We need uh, a material from which uh, we can uh, build the uh, object. Then there has to be uh, a cause or a, a goal or a, the end of uh, this uh, object. Uh, Aristotle believes that there is a purpose for existence and every uh, object uh, moves towards this end. Uh, for our case, a wireless sensor node has a specific uh, purpose uh, to, uh, to exist. And then uh, the other cause is the design. We have to design this, uh, this object. The design has to be invested into this uh, object. And it is usually uh, through the form or the design that our brain uh, interacts with the physical world. So the, um, our understanding or comprehension about any physical object is uh, by perceiving or taking in uh, and storing this uh, abstract uh, concept, uh, which is called the form. And then finally, uh, the, we need to have a, an efficient cause or an agent cause, which uh, bring together the other three um, causes to actually re realize uh, the object. Uh, so when we design, we, or when we uh, talk about the design of a wireless sensor, the node, we have to take these four causes uh, into account. Uh, specifically, the design uh, cause is very important uh, for us because it uh, involves both the functional and the non-functional aspect of a wireless sensor node. The functional aspect of a wireless sensor node uh, deals with, you know, what the sensor node should do. Uh, so. Um, when we choose a specific component uh, uh, to be integrated into the wireless sensor node, uh, usually the reason behind this decision is because we have a specific task for it. Uh, equally important is the non-functional aspect of the wireless sensor node. Uh, the non-functional aspect determines how the, the node does what it does. And uh, because we are dealing with resource constrained uh, components, it's very important to 
are dressed in a functional uh, aspect. For example, in terms of the cost of the sensor node, so overall cost of the sensor node, and the size of the, the sensor node, because it has to uh, occupy space. The performance of the, the, the sensor node, uh, we are not only interested in what it does, but how fast it does, for example. Other aspect we need to take into account is the ease with which we can interact with the sensor node, the ease with which the sensor node let itself uh, reconfigured, uh, reprogrammed, and uh, so on. So there is a wide uh, range of decisions to be made, both in terms of its functional aspect and uh, non-functional aspect. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, here you see uh, the architecture of a typical wireless sensor uh, node. I have removed from this picture uh, the non-essential aspects, the non-essential uh, components, as well as the um, power subsystem to make the uh, comprehension uh, easier. So here we have the sensor subsystem, uh, including one or more uh, physical sensors, uh, and also the corresponding analog to digital uh, converters are required to change the analog signal into digital uh, form or bit stream. And then we have the processing subsystem uh, consisting of uh, the different uh, memory units and the actual processor, which does the actual uh, computing, and the radio subsystem also. Uh, and uh, we have the different uh, interconnects, which interconnect these different components uh, with uh, the processing uh, subsystem. Uh, we have different types of um, serial buses, which we uh, will uh, look into more closely. Uh, there also we have to make different types of uh, decisions pertaining to space and uh, speed of communication, um, cost, uh, etc. Um, we begin our discussion uh, with the sensing subsystem. The sensors are the most important components to interface uh, the physical world or the, the physical process we want to uh, monitor uh, with, the, uh, with the computer or with the, um, let's say, processing subsystem. Uh, common to all sensors is that they produce analog signal because the physical world uh, manifests itself in the form of uh, releasing some energy. This energy may be heat energy, uh, it could be mechanical energy in terms of force, for example, or pressure, uh, or angular velocity, or linear acceleration, or it could be in terms of heat or light or some uh, other uh, forms. So the, the one of the responsibilities of a uh, physical sensor is to transform these uh, different types of energies in the form of uh, electrical energy without actually changing or modifying the essential aspect of the physical signal or the physical energy. So usually we don't uh, affect the, the, the frequency or the phase of the signal, or if we do so, we do so um, in a way that it is possible to reconstruct the original uh, signal. So the analog signal which is produced by the sensors is um, continuous both in time and in amplitude. Uh, this, as I say, uh, may represent different types of processes. Here I have listed uh, different types of uh, sensors um, according to their uh, applications. I may not uh, deal with all of them, but I'll give you um, a brief overview. We have accelerometers to sense uh, linear acceleration. This linear acceleration represents some physical movement, and this physical movement is related to uh, physical activities, for example, in um, AVM, which is uh, active volcano monitoring. We measure seismic wave, uh, which produce some uh, physical vibration on the surface uh, of uh, the Earth. Uh, in the structural health monitoring, we uh, measure different types of um, acceleration generated by the uh, physical uh, structures, such as bridges and uh, complex buildings. 
um, in healthcare, we uh, monitor uh, different types of um, human uh, movements, uh, the movement of joints, uh, movement of muscles, um, and ligaments to make sure that you know the um, health of the different types of um, human anatomy function uh, as they, they should. In uh, transportation, especially in monitoring um, uh, uh, trains, uh, the drive quality of uh, trains. Again, we, we we measure vibration generated by the the the, the, the train. In supply chain management, we attach accelerometer sensors. Uh, to own containers and uh, object during uh, transportation to make sure that uh, fragile objects are not damaged by the, the drive uh, quality. We have different types of acoustic sensors to uh, measure also uh, uh, the distribution of pressure in, in pipelines, the quality and uh, type of fluid transporting in, in pipelines. We emit um, sound signals into the pipeline and based on the um, amount of signal received on the other side and uh, the, the change in phase or uh, frequency of this signal it is possible to reason about you know the, the, the quality of a uh, flow uh, the pressure the, the the pipeline undergoes in the type of food uh, being uh, transported so all these uh, physical uh, sensors uh, I, I, I listed uh, transform some physical energy to uh, electrical energy. And by processing the, the electrical energy, it is possible to reason about uh, interesting uh, events. Uh, the first, uh, beside deciding which type of sensors we should integrate uh, into the uh, sensor node, the second decision we need to, do, uh, to, to make is the type of analog to digital uh, converter. Because the um, analog to uh, digital converter takes a single input in the form of analog signal and emits the streams of uh, binary. That means uh, the amount of binary uh, emitted or outputted uh, uh, from the uh, analog to digital converter decides the, the, the communication bandwidth we should um, uh, put in place uh, to make sure that the signal uh, or the bit streams are uh, transported uh, on time. Uh, the amount of um, uh, memory and storage we need to have to store the uh, bit streams and also at the wireless uh, link, the amount of bandwidth we should uh, put in place to make sure that the signal is transported uh, on time. So deciding on the analog to digital converter is a very important uh, decision. Again, uh, what are the, uh, uh, the, the, the aspects which we should take into account to uh, decide which uh, analog digital converter is suitable, decide, uh, determined, is determined by the uh, quantization uh, failure. What is the quantization failure? I will explain to you in the following uh, slides. Suppose here we have uh, an analog signal, the, the, the black signal you, you, you see here, this is analog. So as you can see in time, it's uh, continuous and in, in amplitude, it's also continuous. But the processing subsystem, as well as all the other subsystems, are all digital, so they understand only uh, bits. So this analog signal has to be transformed into bit uh, streams. What we can do is, for at a regular interval, we can uh, sample this analog signal. And then that specific um, sample, which we call a symbol, uh, we can convert it into um, a binary uh, stream. So how can we, we convert? Again, the, the interval is decided by the frequency of the, the, the signal. If the frequency is large, we have to sample at a, a very short interval. If the frequency is uh, uh, small, uh, then we have, uh, it suffi suffices to uh, sample only um, occasionally. 
uh, this uh, expression is uh, mathematically uh, expressed by the Nyquist theorem. The Nyquist theorem says that we have to sample uh, an analog signal uh, at a frequency which is at least twice uh, bigger than the frequency of the signal so that no information um, is lost. Uh, for sensor network, we should uh, sample the sensor at a much higher uh, rate uh, because the sensor node uh, typically uh, operate in a very harsh environment which uh, affect the, the signal uh, quality. The amplitude again here uh, at discrete intervals, we have to uh, map you know, the magnitude of the uh, analog signal. For example, when we uh, sample the signal at this point, let's say this is uh, around 1.2 volt. Uh, here we have one volt, for example, the next stage is two volt. So we have to map this 1.2 volt either to this or to this one. Since the near uh, is this one, uh, we will map the signal uh, to this one. But in assuming that a 1.2 signal is a one volt, then we have introduced an error of 0 0.2 uh, volt. This is what we call a quantization uh, error. The quantization error we uh, suffer as a result of uh, you know, transforming the analog signal into a digital signal is determined by this uh, formula, Q is equal to EPP over to the power of um, M, uh, EPP divided by to the power of M. EPP is the um, peak to peak amplitude of the signal generated by the sensor, and M is the number of bits we assign to each uh, symbol. For example, if the um, EPP is, let's say, 100, 100 millivolt, let's say, and M is just 4, so to the power of uh, 4 is, uh, this is uh, 64, I think, 2 times 2 is 4 times 8, so 16. So 100 over uh, 16 is the uh, quantization uh, error introduced as a result of deciding to encode each symbol with four, um, four bits. Um, another important aspect we have to take into consideration is the, the, the size of the, the physical size of the, uh, the analog to digital converters. Uh, sometimes we use uh, multi-channel uh, analog to digital converters because uh, we can, uh, you know, multiple sensors can share one and the same uh, analog to digital converters uh, providers that we don't uh, sample these uh, sensors uh, simultaneously uh, of uh, the the cost is of course uh, now the, the um, uh, overall resolution is uh, affected uh, in case both sensors uh, should be sampled in parallel at the same time. Okay, now we have seen the the the, the you know which type of sensors we should integrate. We have seen uh, how we can select the appropriate. Uh, analog to digital uh, converter. The second most important uh, decision we have to make is the processing subsystem. Indeed, next to the uh, radio component, the processing subsystem is the most energy consuming uh, component or subsystem in the um, node. So care has to be uh, made in selecting and integrating the appropriate type of um, uh, a processor or a processing subsystem, we will see uh, the different types of um, decisions we have to make in, in, in this um, respect. To begin with, uh, because the, the processing subsystem is responsible for all type of uh, computing, that means you can say that the processor is the intelligence uh, or the intelligent faculty of the, the node. So we need to understand what type of decision uh, or what type of tasks should be supported by the sensing subsystem. Of course, in, in a wireless sensor network, remember the, um, the nodes, the, the primary goal uh, or purpose of uh, the wireless sensor nodes is to sense a physical uh, process or a physical um, phenomenon. Then the packets have to be processed. So this is another, another task. 
processing packet, for example, this processing mean uh, compressing the data. It could mean filtering the, the data or doing some simple operations such as, you know, computing the average temperature or the average uh, acceleration over a certain period of time. So this type of local uh, computing is the second task. The third task is uh, communication. So the node should communicate the packet uh, to a remote base station. So this requires both point-to-point um, -point communication and networking in case, you know, we have to support uh, multi-hop uh, communication. So these are the additional tasks of a processing subsystem, and especially the, 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 the latter aspect require a more intelligence. The, it's not the, the, the kind of task you should do uh, routinely. So nodes should discover one another. Uh, they have to, uh, you know, implement some advanced communication uh, protocols, such as routing protocols and MAC protocols, which need some flexibility in, in programming. Uh, you know, once we have deployed the sensor node, for example, we may decide to change the, the protocol. This requires um, flexible communication and self-organization. So a, the task of a processor beside doing some low level uh, signal processing involves also some intelligence. That means the processing subsystem should be able to handle this type of advanced uh, tasks. Uh, as I said, the processing subsystem besides the, the processor itself should also take into account uh, different types of memory uh, unit again. Uh, this also requires some uh, uh, interfacing uh, flexibility on the part of the, the, the processor subsystem. In general, we have three types of uh, processor architectures, each having its own advantage and disadvantage. Again, e here we have to make uh, different types of uh, trade-offs in terms of space, in terms of power consumption, in terms of cost, and uh, on one hand, and on the other, in terms of efficiency, in terms of capability, um, and in terms of uh, uh, speed. So the first architecture we're going to consider is the von Neumann architecture. The von Neumann architecture is the simplest processor architecture and the, the most compact of uh, all the other architectures. And it's the first uh, generation um, architecture. In the von Neumann architecture, we have two building uh, block, the, the processing subsystem and the, the memory subsystem. Um, and there are two buses. The memory subsystem is always interconnected with the processing subsystem using parallel buses for the sake of speed. But remember that parallel buses uh, occupy a large amount of space. Uh, other than here in sensor network, we don't use uh, parallel uh, buses. So in the von Neumann architecture, we both the uh, instruction and the data are stored in the data memory. There is one bus for addressing the, the, the for addressing the, the memory and a bi-directional bus for exchanging data and instruction in both directions. So the processor can fetch data from the memory or uh, write data into the, uh, the memory using uh, this bus. As I said, this is the simplest architecture we have and the most compact. The disadvantage of this architecture is that uh, the number of cycles required to fetch data and uh, uh, instruction from the memory unit is relatively uh, large. That means if, for example, I want to uh, fetch just one instruction and one um, data unit, then I have to use two uh, cycles. So the von Neumann architecture, uh, it, for its compactness, it also entails uh, slow uh, computation uh, time. Uh, in, in summary, here I have already uh, given you the von Neumann architecture uh, employs a single memory uh, space uh, for storing both program and data, uses a single uh, bus to transport uh, or to transfer data and instruction, uh, but its uh, speed of computation is rather slow because the same bus is used to uh, transfer data and uh, 
uh, instruction. The Harvard architecture is the second uh, generation architecture. Here you can see that now we have two different types of memory units. We separate instruction and um, um, data uh, to make sure that they can be uh, fetched in parallel using just a single uh, cycle. The, the cost we undertake in this case is now a double, almost double uh, space. So here we have more resources. Uh, we have uh, two different um, instruction, sorry, address buses, and two different types of uh, data buses. One is used to interconnect the, the processor with the data memory, and the other bus is uh, required to interconnect the program me uh, memory with the uh, processor. In, remember, both buses are here, uh, parallel buses, which are uh, quite expensive. So the, the size of the Harvard architecture compared to that of the von Neumann architecture is significantly large. But again, uh, it's also faster now because of the um, uh, parallel uh, architecture, it's possible to fetch instruction and uh, um, data at the same time. So here you can see um, the summary of the Harvard architecture. The other architecture we have is the super Harvard architecture, uh, which is commonly referred to as Shark. Here, uh, two additional components to the Harvard architecture are introduced. So the first one is here now we have a cache um, block to uh, store frequently used uh, instructions. This facilitates uh, computation. And then here we have another uh, block, which is called the input output controller, so that we can support uh, direct memory access. One of the main difficulty in using the von Neumann architecture, as well as the, the, the Harvard architecture, is that um, you know, all communication between different components should take um, through the, the processing subsystems. The, the processing subsystem, and this makes the processing subsystem very busy. Some I/O uh, interaction, for example, uh, communication between the um, you know between the memory unit and the network uh, interface card, for example, does not need um, the uh, intermediary of the processor subsystem. Similarly, if uh, we want to save data from the um, data memory to the flash, we don't need the, the processing subsystem because this is just a routine task which involves just two uh, blocks. So the direct memory access capability of the super Harvard architecture enables the isolation of the processing subsystem or, uh, from, from this type of uh, task. This uh, facilitates uh, uh, computation and increases um, efficiency, but the cost uh, we incur or uh, introduce as a result is a more um, advanced uh, processor architecture, uh, larger processor architecture, and power consumption now uh, increases. Another thing uh, uh, I mustn't forget is that uh, the program memory can also be used to uh, to store uh, data in case you know the data memory is not sufficient to accommodate all the data we want to to store. Okay, so these are the three main uh, processor architecture uh, architectures uh, we have. Which of the architectures is suitable for building a wireless sensor node depends again. The, the, the cost we are uh, ready uh, to forego or to, uh, to, to uh, introduce, and also the um, uh, requirements of the, the application. Uh, next, I'm going to give you uh, four different types of uh, processors. Uh, again, uh, to, to make sure that uh, we have the right of flexibility in putting together the, the different components of a wireless sensor node. The first uh, processor architecture we have is microcontrollers. Uh, generally, we don't use uh, microprocessors for wireless sensor networks, uh, sensor networks 
because they are very expensive. They are, are quite advanced uh, general purpose uh, processors. Uh, and most of the, uh, the uh, architectural components of a microprocessor we don't really uh, need. Uh, as a result, uh, microprocessors are considered to be out of the scope of uh, this lecture. So the, the first general purpose processors we have are uh, microcontrollers. Microcontrollers are in, in, in many respects similar to microprocessors uh, at a micro level, at a mini um, complex uh, level. So here a microcontroller integrates um, a, its own CPU core, uh, internal uh, memory to store instruction and data needed for a specific uh, operation. It has its own uh, read-only memory, um, uh, electrically uh, erasable uh, 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 random access memory, and um, different types of uh, uh, memories uh, to store uh, data both uh, uh, locally and uh, temporarily. Uh, it also uh, provides different types of um, um, interfaces, serial interfaces, as well as parallel inter IO interfaces, uh, in up to uh, four to eight different types of analog to digital uh, converters, uh, general purpose analog to digital converters. That means uh, if the, uh, the sensors we use are relatively simple, for example, if we're going to use light sensors, temperature sensors, humidity sensors, you know, the, the, the output of which does not change considerably in a very short period of time, it is possible to use the general purpose um, ADCs which are embedded in, 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 the, uh, in the microcontroller. Most microcontrollers we, we have for sensor networks provide up to 10 bit resolution uh, general purpose uh, ADCs. So for example, if we just quickly go back to the uh, beginning here, you see, in this case, the light sensor here, we don't have, we don't need external ADC to interface this light sensor with the processing subsystem. We just can use a simple conductor uh, and connect it in one of the pins of the microcontroller controller so that the analog signal of the uh, light sensor can directly be fed uh, into one of those uh, general purpose, uh, general purpose uh, uh, ADCs. Uh, coming back, uh, we can uh, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of uh, microcontrollers. Microcontrollers are a general purpose. That means they are flexible. Uh, they also provide a large amount of uh, general purpose devices, clocks, for example, which we can uh, use for different types of applications. Uh, so this uh, relatively, uh, relative to their um, uh, compact structure, uh, small size and cost, they are quite useful. And uh, as far as my knowledge is concerned, almost 90, 95% of the available sensor nodes use microcontrollers at their uh, processing subsystem. The disadvantage is that, uh, especially if we do uh, numerical operations, advanced signal processing, uh, they are not really uh, designed um, for efficiency. So this is one of their uh, problems. So if we are looking for advanced signal processing, for example, for machine learning purposes or for deep learning purposes, um, probably microcontrollers are not the best. Uh, and um, if we uh, wish to design uh, application specific algorithms again, um, it is likely that uh, some of the available onboard uh, components may not be used quite often, uh, but at the same time, they may uh, consume uh, energy. So in terms of efficiency, uh, microcontrollers have this type of demerits. The other type of processors are digital signal processors. These uh, digital signal processors or DSPs 
are intentionally or purposefully designed to handle advanced num numerical uh, op uh, uh, operations as well as uh, uh, signal processing. So they also involve uh, hardwired uh, digital filters, um, uh, conditioning circuits. So they are quite uh, efficient, for example, to process uh, sine and cosine waves, uh, Fourier transforms, cosine transforms uh, for different types of uh, image processing, uh, audio signal processing that are very good, uh, but they are not that good for handling um, general purpose uh, protocols and uh, algorithms. So uh, if you are looking for advanced signal processing, uh, they are powerful, they are, uh, provide complex uh, digital filters, as I say, uh, for low level, um, you know, signal uh, conditioning, uh, this type of processes are very good, but they are not easy or flexible in terms of, you know, implementing general purpose uh, protocol, especially communication uh, protocol, which do not necessarily require a mathematical operation uh, rather, they require uh, logical operations uh, for this uh, general purpose microcontrollers are rather useful. The other types of processors we, we have are application specific integrated uh, circuits. Uh, these uh, try to implement all the, the functional aspect of the, the processor using hardwired uh, circuits. That means they uh, attempt to uh, reduce the overload uh, introduced by, you know, advanced uh, software. Um, so if you are looking for highly efficient, uh, well-tailored um, processes which uh, should, you know, perform some specific uh, tasks, uh, you should go for application-specific integrated circuits. There are two types of um, ASCIs. Uh, the first one is a fully customized, and the second one is uh, partially or half customized. A fully customized uh, ASCII comes with a fully implemented uh, uh, integrated uh, circuit. That means uh, there is very little flexibility. It's optimized for efficiency in terms of computation time and efficiency in terms of uh, power consumption. But uh, if you wish to change the program uh, logic after deployment, it's very difficult because it does not support advanced uh, uh, computation in terms of, uh, you know, uh, advanced modification of protocols or algorithms. The half customized uh, are um, partially programmed, but uh, you can also use them or um, reconfigure them after uh, production, uh, so more flexibility is um, available. But again, uh, application-specific uh, integrated circuits are intended to carry out some application-specific tasks, which are already known at the time the, the node is developed, and which are less likely to be changed after uh, deployment. Uh, the last one we have uh, to consider is a field programmable gate array, uh, FPGA. Uh, today, uh, FPGAs have a wide range of uh, applications, again, in, in, uh, at the level of low-level signal processing. They uh, accommodate uh, hardware components which can be uh, easily wired and rewired uh, for uh, different types of configurations. Uh, by doing so, uh, they try to achieve flexibility. Again, these are not general purpose uh, and, uh, microcontrollers. In fact, some of them, some of the FPGAs have their own custom made uh, microcontrollers embedded into them uh, to facilitate operation. Uh, to a certain extent, they are reprogrammable highly efficient, more com they are uh, capable of handling more complex algorithms, mostly mathematical operations. Uh, 
Uh, there are certain sensor nodes which use uh, field programmable gate uh, arrays because of their uh, computational power. Uh, again, which of the processors is um, more suitable for a specific uh, application depends on the requirements of the, the application. In general, these are the four different types of uh, processors available on the market to to build a wireless sensor node. Okay, uh, this is a brief uh, summary of the advantages and disadvantages of application uh, field programmable gate arrays. You know, high bandwidths are available compared to DSPs. They are relatively uh, flexible. They support parallel programming. So multiple routine tasks, uh, which are independent from one another can be uh, uh, computed in, in, in parallel, they also are capable of uh, doing float point operations. Uh, again, uh, FPGAs have a wide range of uh, applications. Uh, relatively seen, they are more costly than uh, microcontrollers, and uh, they also require advanced uh, knowledge uh, to, to program. Okay. Having seen the sensing subsystem and the processing subsystem, the next important uh, building blocks are the communication interfaces or the interconnects. Uh, the decision again, uh, which of the interconnects or the interfaces are suitable depends on the speed of communication between the, between the uh, different building blocks. In the available space, we have to insert a communication interface between the, the, the components. So in, we have to take uh, into account uh, communication efficiency, communication speed in the available space to decide uh, which type of communication uh, process, uh, uh, communication buses are uh, suited. Uh, parallel buses are the most, uh, the fastest. Parallel buses means, um, for example, if eight bits are emitted from uh, analog to digital converters, then we can use eight bits of the, the processor to transfer all the bits at once with a single cycle. But this means A, now we have occupied eight bits of the, the, the processor, uh, which is quite costly, especially if we have uh, many uh, components. And B, now the, the space, the communication subsystem or the communication interface requires to become considerably large. Uh, and in a given sensor node, we don't have that much, uh, that much space. So in designing a wireless sensor node, we don't use parallel buses as interconnects or as interfaces. All we have is a serial, uh, you know, a, a set of serial uh, buses uh, from which we have to make our choice. The disadvantage of serial buses is that, a, you know, a single byte, for example, eight byte has to be streamed bit by bit to the other um, component. This is uh, inevitably slow but then we just need a single uh, wire to stream all the all the uh, bits so we sacrifice speed uh, for gaining space okay uh, there are different types of serial buses available in general purpose computers uh, for example here i have listed the serial peripheral interface uh, which we call spi we have the general purpose input output uh, serial uh, bus. We have the secure data input output in the inter, uh, integrated circuit or the I square C um, are the options. Most of the time for wireless sensor uh, nodes, the first and the last are the most suitable uh, because they give the uh, the right uh, trade-off. For example, if we want to use a full duplex communication, we can use the serial peripheral interface. Or if we need space, then we can opt to um, half duplex bus, which is the I-square bus. So most of the sensor nodes available on the market today 
uh, use uh, SPI and I square C. And I'm going to discuss these two uh, communication interfaces uh, in the following slides. The SPI or serial peripheral interface was first uh, proposed by Motorola in the 1980s to this day. Uh, it doesn't have any standard, but almost all uh, uh, components uh, needing a faster uh, communication uh, use, uh, use it. Okay, so it's a high speed, a full duplex synchronous uh, serial bus. What do we mean by uh, duplex to begin with? So if you have two partners communication, uh, communicating with one another, and if data can go in both direction, we call that the bus supports uh, duplex communication. And now if these two parties cannot communicate at once, but only one of them, so that means either data flows from this to this, or data flow from this to this, either one of them, then we are talking about half duplex. If the two parties can communicate with one another at the same time, then data can go in both direction, then we're talking about full duplex. So the serial peripheral interface supports full duplex communication. So data can flow at any time in both directions. So for that, at least we need two wires, okay? One in this direction and two in this direction. So compared to half duplex serial buses, uh, full duplex serial buses require a larger space. So this is one of their uh, limitations. Now, if we want to integrate two or more components, then each component needs at least four bus, uh, four uh, pins. Okay, so the, the, the first one is for input, the second one is for output, and the third one is for selecting which of the uh, components should communicate, and the fourth one is to synchronize, okay, for clock synchronization. So four pins are required, which makes the SPI uh, less desirable when uh, we are concerned with space, okay? So the, the four uh, pins are depicted as follows. So we have the master, uh, we'll discuss about master and slave um, a bit short, uh, you know, shortly. Uh, so we have the, the, the output pin, uh, we call it the master out, slave in, and we have the master in slave out, and we have the chip select and the uh, serial clock. Uh, let me give you, uh, let me explain this using this uh, figure here. If we have two, two components here, as you can see, to communicate with one another using a full duplex SPI um, interface, then one of them should be a master. What do we mean by a master? A master is the component which initiates a communication. For wireless sensor node, the processor is always the, the master. It is the one which begins or initiates a communication. So the master, I'll, you know, first uh, selects the, 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 the chip by flagging this, this uh, pin, sorry, this pin. So when this pin is flagged, then this slave knows now the master wishes to communicate with this. The clock is important to syn uh, for synchronous co communication, so data will be pushed either to the right or to the left uh, using the clock. Each uh, component, the master and the slave, should have their own registry to temporarily store the, the, the bits to be uh, communicated. Through master out, slave in, the master sends the, the, the data. And through the master in, slave out, the master receives data from, from the uh, slave. So when we have multiple components to communicate with one another, this is the, 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 the structure we have. All of them now share the master in and the master out pins, and as well as the, the, the clocks, but they will have their own individual uh, chip select pins. So here we have, for example, the master now have three uh, chip select. So by selecting the specific chip, it can decide with which of the um, component it wishes to uh, communicate. 
the advantage and disadvantages you can see uh, from the diagram very easily. It is a faster uh, bus, but at the same time, it occupies space. It's not easily extendable. For example, if we want to insert additional component, then either we have to foresee uh, that uh, this extension is uh, forthcoming so that we can have as many chip select as possible. In case this has not been forcing, then we have to replace now the, the, the master with uh, a master having more uh, chip selects. So this is a disadvantage of the uh, SPI besides the space it occupies. The uh, I square C on the other hand, is a half duplex um, bus. So data can go only in one direction at any given uh, time. It is very easy to um, in, uh, integrate. All just need two, uh, two parallel pins. So the first is uh, important for uh, selecting, uh, you know, for indicating uh, whether the channel is occupied or free. And the other is required to uh, communicate um, data. There is no specific master. Any can assume a master by seizing the, the medium. All the, the components first listen to the uh, medium to see whether there is uh, communication taking place between any two uh, components. If the medium is idle, then they can flag the uh, chip select to indicate that, okay, the, the medium is occupied. And then they have to address uh, themselves as well as the um, destination address. By sending the destination address, they will send a warning to the other component. Communication is going to take place. And then from then, on, from then onwards, the two can communicate with, uh, with one another. Uh, I square C is easily extensible. Uh, if the, the, the communication bandwidth is not, uh, you know, the requirement for communication bandwidth is large, uh, this is the most uh, suitable uh, communication interface because it does not occupy uh, a large space. Uh, Initially, uh, seven bits were needed to, um, uh, you know, uh, address uh, component uh, in a unique way. Uh, today, I square C uh, supports 10-bit uh, addressing so that we can integrate uh, as many components as uh, as possible. Uh, one of the uh, problem with I square C is that there is no synchronization as such. You know, there is no standard. Uh, synchronization. So uh, if two nodes uh, wish to communicate uh, with one another, one of them may uh, support uh, a faster communication and the other may not support a faster communication. So the two may not directly uh, or easily agree uh, on the communication speed. So usually one of them, uh, the master, should uh, estimate the uh, communication speed of its partner and scale down or scale up its communication um, accordingly. Uh, another problem with uh, I square C is that there is no fair um, algorithm to arbitrate uh, the medium. Okay, so uh, the two uh, components may uh, occupy the medium endlessly if the, the, the need arises while all the others are uh, starving. Uh, but since all the components belong to one and the same uh, sensor node, uh, this arbitration is usually uh, achieved by the, the processing uh, subsystem or by the uh, programmer uh, putting together all the, uh, the program components. In for our case, for example, the uh, operating system. Okay, uh, the I square C supports two types of uh, communication mode. Uh, fast communication mode, which is the normal pro uh, communication mode, which is bit by bit um, transfer of data uh, between two communicating partners. Or uh, we have the high speed uh, mode. That means the I square C supports byte by byte 
communication. So bit streams can be, uh, you know, eight bits can be sent one after another without the need to uh, send uh, acknowledgement. This will be temporarily stored uh, on the other side of the I2C component. And um, now acknowledgement can be sent for all the, the eight uh, bits, either all of them have arrived safely, or if one of them is not arrived safely or corrupt, then all of them um, will be rejected and a new round of communication uh, is requested. So this is uh, what we call a byte by byte communication. So the, the, no, the default communication um, uh, pattern is bit by bit communication for which each bit is acknowledged. But if a faster communication is needed, then I2C is capable of supporting byte by byte communication where the whole byte is acknowledged as a single, so to say, packet. Okay, so this explains uh, the, the different addressing modes. Initially, this block you see uh, eight uh, bits where, uh, no, seven bits were required to uh, address. But uh, when we want to um, uh, integrate more than 121 uh, components, then uh, more than seven bits uh, are required to address the components uniquely. Uh, today, up to 10 uh, bits are assigned uh, for, uh, for addressing. So here, uh, a communication in, in, in the older uh, version, a start flag is sent to um, indicate that a communication uh, begins. Then the slave uh, sends the, the, the address, and then uh, this uh, will be flagged by, uh, you know, the, the end of communication will be uh, indicated by uh, flagging the read or write bit of the master. Then acknowledgement comes, and the whole thing repeats um, all over again. But now the, the read write flag and the acknowledgement are used. Uh, as additional blocks for the um, acknowledgement, sorry, for the addressing, so that now we can uh, address or integrate um, more than 121 components in a single sensor node. Okay, the summary here, uh, briefly summarizes the advantages and uh, disadvantages advantages of SPI and I square. Uh, C uh, communication uh, interfaces. The SPI, as I said, is a full duplex, faster uh, communication interface, but its space requirement is larger than the I2C. Uh, I2C, on the other hand, is a half duplex, easily integrable, easily in uh, extensible, but relatively uh, slow. If the sensor subsystem uh, produce a large amount of data, usually we choose uh, I2C, uh, but for sensors such as light sensors, humidity sensors, um, barometric sensors, which uh, you know, processes uh, which do not change uh, appreciably over time, we can use I2C. Okay, in the following three, um, uh, of four slides, I'm going to uh, show you three different types of sensor node architecture, just to show you the design flexibility we have in putting together the different components of a wireless uh, sensor node. The first one is the iMode sensor architecture. This is a sensor node designed by the um, Intel. Here you, uh, you can see uh, what, uh, the different types of the processing subsystem. Here, the processing subsystem has two different types of uh, processors, the general purpose processor and the um, DSP processor. The DSP processor uh, can be switched on if we need advanced uh, mathematical uh, signal processing and audio processing uh, applications. But if we don't, usually the exascale uh, CPU is used. The 802.15.4 radio is used for low power uh, communication. The processing subsystem has three different types of um, uh, memories, 32 uh, megabyte uh, flash memory, uh, 32 megabyte asynchronous digital um, random access memory, and 256 kilobyte uh, static RAM. 
Here, the sensing subsystems you can see are uh, he, the eye mode sensor has a humidity uh, and temperature sensor. It, this requires this general purpose input output um, interface. But we have the 3D accelerometer uh, integrated in the eye mode sensor using the SPI uh, interconnect. And uh, we have uh, the temperature and light sensor, which use the I square C. Uh, communication uh, interface. So both type of interfaces are used here, the, the SPI for sensors which use uh, a faster communication and for sensor which use uh, slower communication, the I square C, which is a very good uh, compromise. The other sensing subsystem here uh, designed at the Yale University is the XYZ uh, node architecture. This, is, uh, this node is especially designed for supporting indoor localization. So here we have different types of uh, movement sensors uh, requiring um, la, uh, you know, high sampling uh, rates. Uh, here we have the uh, processing subsystem. The processing subsystem interconnects the, the radio subsystem using the SPI interface. And here we have the power management subsystem. The power management subsystem is interconnected with the um, processing subsystem using the I square uh, C uh, subsystems. In the different types of sensors, including the mobility uh, subsystem, are directly interconnected um, with the uh, uh, processing subsystem because they all use the internal general purpose analog to digital converters the microcontroller um, makes available. Okay, so this is uh, a very simple and uh, comprehensive way of integrating the different uh, off the shelf uh, components to build a wireless sensor node. The other architecture I am interested in is uh, the hog drop uh, architecture. This uh, sensor node is designed to monitor uh, peaks in their everyday life. So from the very beginning, the sensing task is known and predetermined. So the uh, researchers uh, decided to use uh, FPGA for this uh, sensing task. And here the communication subsystem is interconnected uh, with the uh, processor using the SPI uh, interface. The other different types of uh, sensing uh, subsystem, either they have their own internal um, analog to digital converter so that the output is already a digital bit stream using the I square C, or they use external uh, ADCs and then this external ADC is interconnected with a, a different uh, subsystem using uh, the SPI uh, and the UART um, interconnect. So I hope this gives you a, a, an overview of a wireless sensor node and how the different components of a wireless sensor node can be uh, interconnected with different types of um, communication uh, subsystems. Um, this uh, session focuses, focused mainly on, on the, um, the hardware um, uh, integration of uh, components. In the next session, we will uh, deal with the software aspect, which is the operating uh, system. Uh, thank you for listening. And by this, uh, we come to the end of today's session.